Welcome back to Taking Inventory. This week I am solo as Daniel Druger is gallivanting around Europe. But we're excited to have James Avery, the founder and CEO of Kevl, today here on the podcast. Aside from starting Kevl, which I think is one of the coolest ad tech companies out there, James was the co-founder of TechPub, which helped developers learn from high-quality screencasts. He's also been writing code and starting companies for the past 20 years, while also writing books for O'Reilly, Rocks, and Microsoft Press. Additionally, he's an advisor to a bunch of startups and is just an overall great guy. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it, James. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course, man. Well, yeah, I think maybe a good place to start is... Like, how did, can I just tell us about like how Kevl came to be and maybe even before that, a bit more about, you know, how you started companies just in general? Yeah. I mean, I, so originally like, you know, engineering background, you know, was, was doing like kind of consulting, right? So like going to work for big, boring, like tech companies to help them with like enterprise software projects. And so I was, I was bored at work and would do stuff like write books and start blogs and start websites. You write it like full, you're writing like full books. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I always cheated a little bit and got like co-authors to like help, help do it. So <laughs> if you ask my co-authors, they would say they did more of it, but you know, but alphabetically Avery comes first. So, you know, you got to put the author's names in alphabetical order. But uh, so, you know, it was always like kind of scrappy. Like now it's like the, you know, the, you know, what indie, indie hackers and like this kind of mentality. Like that was me. I was just like starting different stuff while I was like consulting during the day. And then one of the things that we started, I was actually another guy who started it. And then I kind of joined was a small like ad network. And we were just like, this is like back when blogging was a thing. And we were like, let's just create a small ad network for other engineering bloggers. And we'll, uh, you know, go to advertisers and, and sell ads. And the fascinating thing was that we used to run like AdSense and you'd make like pennies on AdSense. And then you start selling ads directly to brands. And we were making, you know, at least dollars, right? Like it was, you know, going from making a couple bucks a month to 50 to a hundred bucks. And so we scaled that ad network up. Uh, and that's, that was like my introduction to the ad business. I didn't go work at Google or, or anything like that. Like we kind of from a, from the outsider's view of building an ad network. And that's when I built all the original technology. Okay. So you built it all yourself initially? Yeah. So originally I, I built everything originally. Thankfully, I think none of that is left. Every once in a while, somebody will like find a, like some commit somewhere and be like, this looks like James code, but I don't think it actually is. I think, I think it's all gone from the platform, which is good forever. And then how, how did the transition from, so it was originally like the, was the arc, like ad, ad network, ad server, and then basically ad server APIs. Like how did the whole flow work to how you got to where you are today? Yeah, because originally it was, how do we help other people start ad networks? And then we realized that fundamentally it is not a great business. I mean, I didn't want to run one, so it's not surprising that a bunch of other people didn't want to run one. And then we, we focused on kind of traditional ad serving, but Google has such an advantage there with ad acts that the customers we signed were the customers who were doing something like unique, right? So it was people like Reddit, you know, back in 2012, 2013, that made us realize that, hey, if we, if we expose this API, companies will build on that API and they'll do, they'll do cool, innovative stuff. And so that really became the focus, you know, 2013-ish timeframe was let's be the Twilio or Stripe of advertising. Like, how do we unlock more innovation in the ad space by, you know, providing an ad server through an API interface? And, and then, like, fast forward to today, like, how big are you guys, like how much have you guys raised now? And then what are some good examples of like, you know, like most people probably don't even know some of the ad systems you guys power. Like what are good examples that are out there? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we've raised, you know, I guess close to 30 million now. We're, you know, 100 and, 110 people, you know, working with powering over a hundred ad platforms. Uh, we, you know, unfortunately, some of the, some of the coolest ad platforms, they use us kind of in the background and we respect that. So we don't publicize it, but there are some great ones too, that like, you know, are, are, you know, happy for us to talk about it. So, you know, some of my favorites are like Klarna, like Klarna is a great example of like a company with like unique first party data with a great experience for the user. And they've built like a really, you know, compelling ad platform 
where they're not, you know, they're not pumping their data out into the ecosystem. They're, they're holding it, you know, on their side and then able to sell really unique native ads that can be like checked out, right? That you can buy the product right there through the car map. Crazy. And, and then from like, you know, I was looking at your site earlier, just like, you know, you have Klarna, which is like fintech, but then you have a bunch of like the retail media stuff. Like, have you found that, like, you know, there, there's that, the saying, like, everything's an ad network. Like, are you guys kind of proof that, like, that can be the case? And that's funny. I asked somebody and, the other day, was like, sent me that article or whatever, you know, about, like, you know, everything's becoming an ad network. And I was like, you know, it's easy to say that, but then somebody's got to do the hard work of making that true. And that's, that's what we're doing, right? Like, we're, we're helping everybody become an ad network. Because, yeah, 100%, like, like you know, we signed banks recently, right? Like there's, you know, there's lots of companies, whether it's retail or it's travel, you know, that are, that are really, you know, looking at how do we build ad platform? How do we, how do we you know, expand our business? Yeah. I saw you did a, like a video interview, I think it was like last week, but you were talking about how, you know, like the big thing for you is that like, this is about like the, tr the how like the trade budgets are changing as opposed to necessarily just like pure audience extension. Like, can you kind of give, listeners a good point of view because i think you know i've had conversations with people who are like okay like i'm gonna build an ads business and they almost immediately kind of turn it into they're doing it as a purpose for audience audience extension purposes which like kind of seems that that like the, the natural end of that is that you're just pumping custom audiences to facebook and google and like if that's the purpose of it then it's kind of like why go all those trouble building an ad network like what, what's your kind of point of view of like of like that use case versus some of the ones that you guys are powering, like kind of where it all ends up. Yeah. I mean, I think like the way I think about it is like the, if you look at the companies that have built like the, you know, top ad platforms of our time, right? Like who is that? Like Google, Facebook, Snapchat, right? Like, like these companies, you know, they're not just doing audience. Extension. They didn't just go sign up for like, you know, Google and throw some banner ads on their site, right? Maybe they did it first, but that's not where they evolved into. And so we, we look at it as like, you need to build a comprehensive ad platform and audience extension might be part of that, but it's kind of the least interesting part, right? Like there's a lot of data available, you know, like if you're a retailer and you think you have unique d data about like a, a set of users, like it's probably not unique, right? Like somebody's, somebody's already selling your data, right? Or Experian has that data or, you know, like how many people know that like, you know, that, that you go to, you know. Safeway and you buy, you know, Doritos. Like a lot of people know that, right? It's not like Safeway owns that. It's the only one who owns. It. And so I think the, you know, audience extension is, is, you know, maybe it's part of a good network, but it's not, you know, it's not the end game. And especially with like third party cookies going away and all the changes that are coming, it's like, what's the, you know, what happens then, right? Like how, how much can you, can really have that audience if you're, if you're losing a lot of that tracking yeah, and I guess like from your perspective, just given like knowing kind of how you guys have built a lot of your stuff like server side, can you kind of explain to people like why Kevl is kind of like insurance against that in some ways? Like I guess like using you guys should make it where over time a lot of this cookie deprecation stuff isn't going to like kill your business, right? Is that like kind of one of the premises of it? Yeah, and, and I think like the customers, it tends to be like the customers we work with have like first party. And so they, you know, they can do things server side. They, you know, don't rely on cookies. They don't rely on third party data. And so that makes them really resilient to, you know, kind of all the, all the changes or the privacy changes that are going on. You know, unfortunately, like a traditional publisher who doesn't have anybody log in, like we can't really help them. Like, I think that it's going to be a tough, a tough business. Like it's going to only get tougher, right? If you're like CNN.com, where I've probably gone to CNN.com for the last, 20 years, never logged in. I don't even know if you can log in. Maybe you can, right? But it's like, they, they have no clue who I am, like other than through third-party cookies. And so I think that that business is just going to get tough. But I think the businesses where you have, like where people log in, where people shop, where people, you know, transact in some sort of way, those businesses have like an advantage now because that data is going to be harder to come. And, and like for, I know a lot of your use cases have been like, you know, app retail, like when it comes to TV and like connected TV, like, do you see that you guys have a pretty interesting spot to play there? And then also just like, you know, we've talked about this before. Like, I, I kind of like 
think of myself as like a wall garden guy. And so like for some reason I'm like fascinated by the trade desk and like everything they do and how like I kind of feel like like long term they're gonna run into a bunch of the wall gardens. And maybe this is like a little meandering, but like and in some ways you guys are like creating a bunch of wall gardens. <laughs> like and so do you have like a, a point of view of like how this sort of ends up with like maybe using connected TV as the example of like do you like do you see a world where you guys are like powering like Peacock and you know Max and all this stuff and then like Trade Desk is trying to get in there like w where does this whole fight gonna go over time or is that like not to make Trade Desk the enemy but like where does it all you know how does it all play over time. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, I mean, remember early on, like, you know, Facebook had, like, the exchange that you could, like, bid into, right? Yeah. Wasn't it, like, they, like, the original BSCs? F yeah. yeah. They, but and they did it, like, knowing the they were going to hurt people. They, like, straight up did it knowing they were going to, like, pull the rug back, you know? Sure. But, like, but like Facebook has a scale that, like, not many other companies, right? And so I think, I think that, like, the walled gardens that we're helping create and a lot of the ones that are out there would be very like would be totally fine if Trade Desk was facilitating the buying of it, right? Like a good example would be like Roku, where like we don't work with Roku, but you know I know they have a partnership with Trade Desk, and it's like Roku is a good example of like where they they should probably invest you know more in their ad platform, right? Like they've done a lot, but there's there's more opportunity there for Roku, but there's no reason that they shouldn't also let Trade Desk bid into Roku, right? As long as they're being protective about their data and their you know. You know, because like Trade Desk isn't the one taking, you know, they're they're charging a fee to the brand, but they're not really taking like a big tax. What they don't want to do is get in bed with all the SSPs and all the networks and all the people in the middle who are then going to like take big chunks of that that money as it passes. And so I guess like in that world, like if you had, if there was a bunch of Kevl powered wall gardens, you could see them just kind of like kind of filling remnant in a weird way. Like is that? Well, I think it's. I don't even think it's remnant because I think. I think when you look at like this is something I talked about on that on the Trader Talk TV thing we did with 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 the Exchange Wire was like I I don't see why promoted listings can't be bought from like if you're if you're Procter and Gamble and you're like okay we're trying to sell more diapers in Los Angeles and we've targeted this zip code and we realize that this zip code's not buying enough diapers right. Which is like the level that they look at this sort of stuff. Like you would see them saying, well, we're already buying stuff in Trade Desk for display. We're buying CTV. Why can't we also make sure that we're promoting Pampers and any sponsored listings that are being shown to anybody in that, in that area, right? Do they really want to go log into like Instacart's UI and, and GoPuff's UI and Kroger's UI and Safeway's UI. Like, you know, it's like, that's not, that's not a world that makes sense. Like at some point that stuff should be programmatically. And like, we're starting like a working group on a, like, how do you, how do you change open RTB so you could say like, I want to promote PAM, right? Okay. It's, like, it's not, it's not that hard of a leap. Like, it's like, if you, if you think about the technology, it's a bunch of UPC codes and, and the attribution is a little bit different. And like, would you guys, do you think, is there a place ever for Kevl kind of on the, I guess, like on the buy side? Like, would you ever aggregate all of your supply and let people buy against it? Or you think it's like, for you guys, it's like you're staying, like you stay kind of on the, the pub side? Yeah, I think there is like, for like, like speaking of like Trade Desk, I think they've done a really good job of being like, we're, and I think our approach has always been like, we should do the same thing on this instance. Because like once you dip your toe on the buy side, suddenly you're more about what does Procter and Gamble want instead of what does Safeway want, right? Yeah, and I think that's the that's where we I think there's you know we're we're talking to people like you know I know there's there's people out there looking at you know how do you build a promoted listing DSP, how do you build a you know you know SSP for for you know this kind of space like one I think you don't necessarily need SSPs right like I think especially for something like this where there's not going to be a hundred thousand different companies that you want to work with. It's probably a couple hundred. Right. And so like that, you know, I don't know that you need that, but I do think like we need the DSPs to be able to like innovate and like that can be slow. And, and on like the DSP side, like you know, again, like, cause coming from kind of our world where, you know, it would say it's like more, 
you know, it's aggregation of like SMBs, like Snap, like our goal, which like, you know, I don't, we didn't do perfectly, but the goal was like, how can we become like an Instagram competitor? Like Shopify sellers, like that's a place where they can aggregate them. And I feel like the Wall Gardens have done a good job of aggregating the SMB demand, but like to my knowledge, at least like the traditional DSPs are still kind of at the agencies. Like yeah. for you guys to do, like for that working group, are you guys like talking about like, how do you make this applicable to to like Shopify sellers? Like, is there is there a world in which you think this can work like kind of outside of the trading desks, not like the trade desk itself? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like you saw that with like a good example of that is like retargeting, right? Like it was like retargeting was something that you could always do with, you know, the trade desk or whatever. But then you had companies like AdRoll and Marion and these other companies come up that were like, oh, we bring retargeting to the mid market. Like, I think the same thing will will happen here, right? Which is like, especially for a lot of these brands where maybe they have, you know, they're, you know, a smaller brand, but they have wide distribution, right? Like maybe they're in a bunch of different grocery store brands and they're available in a bunch of delivery apps. You know, somebody's going to have to build the tool that helps them buy across. Yeah, and there's, you know, today there's like, what is it, like Commerce IQ and Sky and PackView. Yeah, that they, they do they do some of that today, but it's all it's all API approach. Like, so it's all like like making API calls and setting up the campaigns in each of the different systems, which is okay, but it's not like an actual true RTB. Like, there's a yeah. opportunity of, of that kind of action. It should, and and then I guess like kind of switching gears to some of the like you know, some of the stuff like we're working on right now with a bunch of AI stuff, like as you guys have been building out kind of I don't know, next iterations of Kevl, like, do you guys find that there's like how disruptive, if at all kind of is all this stuff? Cause like, you know, so much of it's being abstracted. Like, I don't know, I don't know if you played around with like Google's performance max or Meta's advantage plus, but like, it's like the most black boxy thing you've like ever seen now. And, and, and in some ways, maybe that's a good thing for you guys because you guys just make this like stupid easy for people to set up campaigns. But I don't know, has that changed the way you guys are thinking about things on the roadmap and how you think about creative and all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, not as much because we're, I think because we focus on the supply side and I feel like so much of the disruption is going to come to how how things are bought, right? And so in the case of, you know, things like Performance Max and and those tools, like I think the the opportunity there is for somebody on the buy side to to build that for you know the open web, right? Like to build that for or the you know, open walled gardens, right? Like the other ones yeah. that are right because like you know Facebook is like oh we're gonna do performance max and like we're gonna you know we're gonna make sure you most effectively spend money on us for a for a marketer. You know, it's like they, so they have performance max on Google and they have whatever it is on Facebook and then they go set up another one somewhere else, right? These are all like, yeah, like who's really building the thing for the marketer to say, you know, the dream of a marketer of like, hey, I just, I need this many leads or I need this many sales. Like I need to just, yeah. I had 10K in sales today and I'm willing to spend $3,000 to do it. Like, how do I do that? Like, that's where I think AI yeah. is going to be. Real. Yeah. The story that we're, we're trying to do some of that stuff. The, the thing that I've been thinking about a lot is, a little bit with like the retail media side in particular, you know, the, the creative right now is still so, again, this is such a buy side problem, but the creative is still like kind of lame. And you feel like there's such an opportunity for all of this, like sort of like using Kevl probably as the ad server, there's all this richness that the creative generative AI stuff can bring to it. Like if, if you've seen, you know, cause you're sitting down with people basically like mapping out what their ad inventory surfaces are gonna look like, have you seen that like publishers or marketplaces are kind of, I guess, banks, because all the things you work with, are these like, are they starting to be more open to like thinking of these surfaces in different ways? Or is it still just like, give me a promoted listing to start and then we can kind of take it from there? Yeah, I think it, it depends, right? Like with the marketplaces and retailers, a lot of times their mantra is like, first, like do no harm. Right. Like they don't, they don't want to harm the user experience. Like at the end of the day, they, they want that person to, you know, make that food delivery order or order that item. And if, if the ads start to, to harm the conversion rate, then that's when they get pulled. Right. And that's always like the push and pull between those sides of like the e commerce. I think where there's a lot more opportunity is when you get into stuff like fintech and other kind of like native opportunities where they do have a lot more freedom about what they can do. 
from a creative standpoint. And I think that's that's where we're seeing more innovation now. I think in the future, you might start to see it in promoted listings, right? Because like it is so often where it's like, yeah, we're just wrapping a, a normal catalog image and saying this is sponsored. But, yeah. you know, can you make it a little bit bigger? Can you make that image a little more dynamic? Can you, you know, generate that image based on what you know about that person? Right. Can you start to do those things? Like, absolutely. I don't think anybody's there. Right. Like, like majority of these retailers are still, you know, they're still in, in kind of the first, the first steps of getting up a, you know, functioning ad flat. And I got a lot of those lines. Have you seen, you know, I saw the news like GoPuff, I think they're using rock to do it, but like they're starting to serve basically like offsite ads, like ads that click out of their retail environment. And like, to me, that's always felt like such a big opportunity for like these retailers to start thinking of themselves like publishers, but it's got to be like a really hard argument to make. Are you seeing like that, you know, people that you're talking to are like more open to it or it's really still like, help me increase my GMV, help me increase my own revenue versus like, help me create net new ad revenue from like offsite. Yeah. I mean, I think it's. It's like, I think the, the rocked and go puff, right. It's like, it's like post checkout. Yeah. And so I think a lot of companies that weren't thinking about post checkout before are starting to think about it. And that's where things get a lot more interesting, right? Because it's like, oh, you, if you already ordered this, if you already completed your transaction, like, what are we doing on that, that post checkout page? Uh, I mean, it rocked, you know, it's like rocked is fine, but it feels like it leaves a lot on the table of like what a sophisticated e-commerce company could. Right. Like based on what they know about what you've ordered in the past, what, you know, whether they're trying to generate new orders or they're trying to send you offsite to a, to a, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think once you, once you get out of that natural, like checkout flow, then you have a lot more opportunity to do, you know, to do other stuff. Yeah. That makes sense. I guess kind of like totally kind of, we, we always ask everyone on these podcasts, but like, Outside of maybe ads, just like in general, like given that you are like a technologist at heart, like what is the stuff that you're playing around with that you think is cool? And like, like when you aren't thinking about ads <laughs> and like trying to get people to open up ad inventory, like what is it that you're most interested in kind of like just in life right now that, that people should look into that they haven't? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I'm fascinated by a couple of things. Like I, I'm definitely fascinated about the just overall finance and world of investing. And I continue to learn, you know, I think learn a lot there about how different things are structured. You know, it's like something that's fun to go dig into, right? Is like, especially as we, you know, people like SVB, right? As they like melt down, like what actually happened there, right? Like the, the surface is interesting, but then it, the, the more you can dig deeper and understand the actual instruments they were buying and how they were doing it. So that's kind of a, uh, area of interest for me. And then tying to that is still like, I, I still think, I think I'm the last person out there, but I still think crypto is really fascinating. And I think now some of the stuff that's being built without the like hype around it is really fascinating. And I think like in the next 10 years, like people will see stuff come out in the crypto space where they're like, oh, this is, this is what everybody was excited about just 10 years later. Yeah. Right? So I, I still think there's a lot, there's a lot in, yeah. I'm still, yeah, I'm, I'm still, I totally buy it still. I mean, I know there's a bunch of like charlatans in it, but like generally speaking, I, I totally do buy it. And it's funny, I, we spent a lot of time looking at actually the ads use case. I don't know if you've played around with any of like the Web3 ad tech stuff, but it is interesting, like, like decentralized Kevils over time or like you guys, like there's like, there's, there's some interesting like analogs to it. Have you played around with that stuff? Yeah, I, I looked at a, I've looked at a bunch of, different like crypto ad tech companies over the years. And, and the problem is I think they're all, they all try to solve like the wrong problem, right? Like a lot of times they're like, oh, we're going to solve the problem that you'll get paid right away for an ad you show. Well, that's not actually a crypto. That's the fact that agencies don't want to pay for ads right away. Problem, right? Like, yeah. Like there's, there's no, the crypto is not solving that problem. Like crypto is, you know, the, the problem to solve there would be making agencies pay on a daily basis yeah. for the ads they run, but like, they're not going to do that, whether it's crypto or cash or whatever. Yeah. And, and then I think there, then there's also my favorite is the, like, I think one of the first like other startups ever looked at the ad space, like 15 years ago was around like, Oh, you'll get paid 
for like the ads that you see, right? Yeah. And like, it's the oldest anti-pattern in ad tech because it turns out that like all the ads you see, you got paid like 10% of what they cost or whatever, you get like $8. Like it's like, totally. and, and the people yeah. who will do something for $8 a year are not the people you want to advertise, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so like I, I say that with crypto as well. Yeah, it's 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 funny because there's like the somewhat analogous, but there's you know, some of the gig economy worker like the apps out there, they rev share the ad revenue with the gig workers, and so it's like a, a supplemental revenue stream. But it's one of those things where like you start to understand like how small like you know like the the impression volume you need to generate real revenue is so massive that like rev sharing an ad tech without billions of impressions is basically useless uh and that's it yeah, it's always like the shock when you see somebody you know somebody hears you're in advertising at a you know party and they're like oh man i have a site we get we get a you know a million page views a month how much do you think i could make you're like i don't know 50 bucks like, you know, like what yeah it's it's wild well cool man. well i i know you got a lot going on so thank you for doing this i appreciate it you're like you know like i said at the beginning I think Kevl is one of the coolest companies in ad tech. I think you're solving such a real problem. And we saw at Snap how hard it is to do this stuff yourselves. And I like, I think anyone listening that is thinking about building their own ad stack, like I have no, I have no financial affiliation with Kevl other than I just think people should use it and innovate on formats and targeting and workflow. So people should check it out. I guess for anyone listening that wants to reach out to you or follow you anywhere, like how can they find you, James? Yeah. So I'm Avery J on Twitter. And on threads. Oh, uh, nice. As, uh, and also, and then Jay Avery at com. Feel free to reach out. Awesome, man. Well, thank you again for doing this. And hopefully we can know you out to LA soon. Catch up in person. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man.